This is System Trader Show, episode number 11. In this episode, my guest, Gary Antonacci, will present you his great research results about momentum investing. Without any exaggeration, I consider his achievements as a breakthrough in the investment world. Welcome to System Trader Podcast. Listen to interviews with top traders and find out how the most successful traders beat the markets and what are the secrets of their success. This is System Trader Podcast with your host, Jack Lempart. Imagine that you spend a few minutes a month to manage your investment. All is rule-based, statistically significant, simple and logical. No place for discretionary decisions. No guessing, no gut feeling, no forecasting. And in the long term, you are almost sure to beat all the actively managed investment funds on the market. Sounds like a scam? Well, everyone should verify everything. But once you do it in this case, you will find out that the name of the presented strategy in this episode, Global Equity Momentum, GEM, is truly a gem. I am so much impressed by the research work done by Gary Antonacci, guest of this podcast episode. To me, it's just amazing that he contributed more to the financial industry than so many university researchers out there. He's a practitioner rather than a man trying to create another great-looking theory which may seem elegant and appealing, but is useless. Fisher Black said once that the theory is right, it just doesn't work. Gary proposed a straightforward yet very effective model based on anomaly which proved to be working for hundreds of years, momentum. Gary has over 40 years experience as an investment professional. After receiving his MBA degree from the Harvard Business School, he concentrated on researching and developing innovative investment strategies that have their basis in academic research. Gary's innovative research on momentum investing was the first place winner in 2012 and the second place winner in 2011 of the prestigious Wagner Awards for Advances in Active Investment Management given annually by the National Association of Active Investment Managers. Ladies and gentlemen, he's my great guest, Gary Antonacci. I hope you will enjoy the show. Hello, Gary, and welcome to my podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you. I'm very glad to have you here today. Um, I have prepared an extensive list of very interesting topics to be discussed today. You're very well known in the industry. However, could you please share with us some short background about yourself, especially in the context of the financial markets? I uh, got started uh, in 1974 in the investment area right out of college. I worked for Merrill Lynch uh, and Smith Barney for a few years and then went on and got an MBA uh, degree from the Harvard Business School and uh, started managing money part-time while I was in business school, never had to go out and uh, find a job. I've always been a professional money manager or researcher ever since. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, and uh, so basically, when you started in uh, like in the seventies, then uh, you stopped working for the financial uh, sector, so to speak, in the eighties. I've I've continued uh, from the seventies uh, continuously. I had a few uh, breaks along the way where I just did a few other things uh, temporarily, but uh, I've always. Uh, kept a pulse on what was going on in the markets and uh, with respect to market research. Okay, I understand. I paid attention to the fact that you've done so uh, some uh, cool things in the past. For example, you were, I found it in your book, a uh, comedy magician and award-winning artist. So why, after all, you decided to work closely with the financial markets again? Well, I was just taking a break, uh, doing those other things. See, in the 1980s, I was very successful uh, managing some hedge funds using traders like Paul Tudor Jones, uh, Richard Dennis, uh, John Henry, uh, Monroe Trout, people like that. So uh, I was able to semi-retire after that and uh, just did some things that I wanted to do that I thought I'd enjoy doing and for the challenge of it. Uh, I'm a naturally an introverted person, so I, I thought if I could be a comedy magician, uh, that would be uh, something uh, that would uh, s stretch my boundaries, you might say. And uh, I was successful at it, as well as uh, 
developing my own art techniques. Um, I exhibited in art shows all, all across the country. Wow, great, great. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, your name became very hot in the industry once you started publishing your papers about momentum anomaly and eventually your highly acclaimed book titled Dual Momentum Investing, an Innovative Strategy for Higher Returns with Lower Risk. And before we will dive into details on momentum anomaly, I'd like to discuss with you some more general topics related to modeling and different market approaches. Uh, could you please give us a very short overview of modern finance, which you put in your book? Of course, we will not have time to discuss it in detail, everything, but you mentioned some theories and models like, for example, efficient market hypothesis or Markowitz mean variance optimization. Also, you mentioned about the capital asset pricing model and black Scholes option pricing. And you paid attention, Gary, to the fact that a healthy dose of skepticism towards some, uh, let's say, highly acclaimed experts is a good thing, especially when it comes to using such theories in our investment. Could you please explain why the academic world has apparently a problem, I don't know if it's a good word, when it comes to creating models which could be successfully applied? Well, we could talk all day about that, but uh, <laughs> let me put it in a little historic uh, context. Um, back in the 1950s or so, uh, I think uh, financial academics had physics envy. They wanted finance to be more of a science. So uh, they came up with uh, the random walk hypothesis, which said that even though stocks drift upward over time, uh, after they did some simple runs analysis and simple serial correlation analysis, they declared the stock just fluctuate randomly uh, otherwise. And that evolved into the efficient market hypothesis, which says that uh, because people are rational, which is an important assumption, that if there were any abnormal profits to be had, uh, people would quickly exploit them, they'd be arbitraged away. So the only thing that really makes sense is to buy and hold the market. Now, uh, there's some problems with the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, while it's uh, the general principles are good, and this is what academics are, are after. They're really after general principles. Uh, someone once said all models are wrong, but they can be useful nevertheless. So the principles behind efficient markets are good in that one should uh, diversify, should keep your costs low, and that it's uh, very difficult to beat the market. But it doesn't mean that uh, it can't be done. Uh, Robert Schiller, who won a Nobel Prize in economics, said that efficient market is one of the most remarkable errors in the history of economic thought. And uh, if you think about it, uh, on, a, on a certain level, you have to think, uh, how can markets be efficient if when... Uh, events shift around prices uh, so much, and it's hard to come up with a rational explanation for large price moves. Now, really, the, the idea behind uh, modern finance has a lot of, to do with uh, Harry Markowitz's work on mean variance optimization. Before that, people didn't really understand uh, what to do with respect to portfolio structuring. Uh, although they did know diversification was a good thing. So Markowitz put it all in a framework of uh, mean variance optimization, where he took these uh, principles out of uh, business, which had to do with linear programming, and he changed it into quadratic programming because we're dealing with uh, variance here. So what he said is if you consider uh, returns, correlations, and volatility, you put them all together, you can come up with the efficient portfolios, which are ones that will give you the highest expected return at any uh, specified level of risk or the lowest uh, risk in terms of volatility at specific levels of uh, <clears throat> return. So uh, it's very elegant. And these academic models uh, tend to be elegant. They tend to be equilibrium-based, which appeals to economists. The, the problem with them is that they're not that accurate. And that was the problem with mean variance optimization. Uh, the uh, 
inputs are very unstable, especially the returns. And uh, the errors are multiplicative because we're dealing with uh, matrix inversions and uh, squared terms in terms of variance. So uh, it's very difficult uh, to get anything stable out of it. And I tried back in the 1980s. I was one of the early people who actually tried to use mean variance optimization. And I ended up incorporating it to some extent, but uh, I had to incorporate other things too, and uh, kind of a Bayesian approach. So there have been people who tried to adjust it with resampling and, and other things, but uh, it also was very cumbersome because it, say you had thousands of securities and you were trying to construct a portfolio, uh, especially back in the 1950s and 1960s, computers just didn't have the power to do these large-scale matrix inversions. So that's where the capital asset pricing model uh, came in. And a separate sets of researchers came to it together uh, separately. And what they did was they said, well, let's put everything in terms of the market and regress uh, everything on the market, and then we'll get a beta and an alpha. The beta is uh, how something moves in correspondence with the market, and the alpha is, you know, any excess uh, return that you might get. And this became very big and very popular. The capital asset pricing model pretty much took over uh, academic finance, and everything was stated in terms of beta. Uh, there were papers that would try to explain commodity prices in terms of beta to the S&P 500 index, which made no sense at all. Uh, and the problem with the capital asset pricing model is, is as Fisher Black said, the theory is right, it just doesn't work. So uh, what would happen is you'd get these high beta uh, stocks or portfolios, and they wouldn't give as high a return as they were supposed to, and lower beta ones would give higher returns than they were supposed to. So uh, people started to look at uh, other ways of adjusting uh, these things. And first they came up with extra market covariances. And finally they came up with factors, which are very popular right now, where they'll look at other things in addition to the market itself, things such as um, value, momentum, uh, volatility, quality, size. And they'll factor these into uh, their portfolio construct. Black Scholes is was uh, another big development in finance. Uh, that was Fisher Black and Myron Scholes who came up with an elegant way of pricing derivatives, and uh, it involves some rocket science. Uh, Edo calculus by uh, Bob Merton uh, contributed. So it was very elegant. Uh, the problem with it too is it didn't work very well uh, on the uh, outliers because it makes an assumption that stocks are, have a uh, log normal distribution, and they don't. They tend to have a higher mean and a fatter tails than that. So uh, out-of-money options were not being priced very well. So again, people had to go back to the drawing board and come up with other uh, types of models, such as a binomial model. So all of these models are good, in that they help explain market uh, function and market behavior, but none of them are all that accurate in, in a real-world uh, situation, including the area of factors um, that are very popular right now. Okay, thank you very much for that, Gary. So we have to just remember that models are just models. I mean, they are kind of approximation to the world, so they never be perfect at all times. I mean, no model is completely true, right? That's correct. Some are some are some are truer than others, but they yeah. they <laughs> they pretty much all have limitations, and uh, people sometimes don't realize that. They might say, "Okay, based on these assumptions, uh, this is what we should be doing," and then they forget that they they have assumptions, and that the world right. doesn't conform to those assumptions. I understand. I understand. Maybe the practitioners are not focusing so much on being so elegant, but rather more uh, focusing on the practical side. Um, Gary, could you please 
share with us an interesting story behind the first index fund uh, at Smith, Barney and Company from 1976. That's a very interesting story. And I think it, it's a, it, it may be very interesting to, to most of the listeners of the podcast. When I uh, was at Smith Barney in 1976, there was a small uh, investment banking firm. They decided to merge with Harris Upham in order to have a retail presence. And uh, they held on to a few of the Harris Upham uh, people in addition to the sales force. One of them was Bob Topol, who was one of the best OTC market makers in the world. And uh, the markets were different back then. It wasn't electronic. So if you wanted to trade in an over-the-counter OTC stock, you had to call up different market makers and ask them what their bid-ask spreads were on the stocks you were interested in. And OTC market makers could do very well, not just from the uh, size of the bid-ask spread, but uh, based on their assessment of the stocks that they held in inventory, you know, how large an inventory they would have in each stock, long or sometimes short. So Bob Topol was a legend in the industry. He was, he was one of the best. And he came around to our office uh, after the merger and uh, explained to us what he did and uh, how we could utilize his service for our clients. Um, and we were impressed. So we gave him some accolades and when he was done talking as kind of an aside, he just said, well, thank you very much, but uh, do you want to hear about someone who does better than me, someone who is actually the best trader that I've ever come across? And so we said, sure. And he said, well, the person who does better than anyone else I know is actually my wife. Would you like to hear what she does? And a of course, we all sat back down and gave him our utmost attention. And he said, my wife is very patriotic. So years ago, she bought all the stocks with United States in their name, like U.S. Steel. Uh, and uh, he went on and, you know, gave a whole list. And, and then all the stocks with American in their names, like American Cyanum and American Telephone. Uh, and he, again, you know, a whole long list. And he said, she did very, very well. So after a number of years, she bought all the generals, General Electric, General Motors, General Dynamics, uh, et cetera. And everybody had a good laugh and went off to lunch. But I couldn't help but think about it. You know, I wondered, why is it that his wife did so well? And Bob was exposed to the best investors in the world. And he was saying that his wife did better than all of them. So I thought about it a while, and what I came up with was she did so well because, first of all, there was no turnover in her portfolio. Back then, commissions were, were high, so uh, she didn't have to pay any commissions. She just buy, bought and held a, a group of stocks. Secondly, there was no management fee to pay to anyone. Uh, money managers and mutual funds, they, you know, your expenses might be 1% to 2% a year, uh, in terms of fees and other costs. And third, she was very well diversified. Back then, we would work on targeted portfolios for our clients. Aggressive ones would have glamour stocks, more conservative investments. Investors might have uh, defensive type portfolios, and they would have certain biases in them. And hers was completely randomized because she picked stocks based on the letters of the alphabet. So in a, in a sense, she created the first index fund, and she did very, very well that way. Well, very interesting. Thank you for that, Gary. Uh, so now we know that passive investing using indexes gives us a huge chance to beat most of the actively managed mutual funds on the market. Although we haven't yet talked about momentum as such, I wanted to quickly ask you why ETF based on momentum, that is implementing simple momentum strategies still cannot beat the market. They are an index fund, but they using a simple strategy still have a problem to, to beat the market. And even in your book, you suggest to, if you want to mimic some momentum strategy using ETFs, you, you give a, let's say, better way to do it rather than using the smart beta uh, ETFs. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a problem with, uh, with momentum that uh, 
some people recognize and, and others dispute. And that has to do with the, uh, the turnover. Momentum is a very active strategy. Uh, you might turn over 25% of your portfolio whenever you make an adjustment. And momentum portfolios, uh, based on the, the theory behind it, do better when you rebalance frequently and when you have focused portfolios. So because momentum stocks tend to be volatile with wide, wider bid-ask spreads than many other stocks, uh, there's going to be some price impact because of that. Um, and it's easy to tell what the top momentum stocks are. You can go on to the Alpha Architect website every month, and they have a list of the top 100 uh, stocks based on uh, 12-month momentum, skipping the last month. So uh, now think about it a minute. Let's say you have billions of dollars, and they're all trying to trade in the same small number of stocks on a frequent basis, there's got to be some price impact. It's as if 20 people were trying to get through the door at the same time. There's going to be crowding uh, going on. So academics who have studied uh, what goes on with momentum uh, have come up with uh, some estimates. And uh, some of them say that uh, the momentum profits disappear because of that. Uh, Nobody knows for sure what's going on there, uh, but that's that's their assessment. Uh, others have said that it's because the momentum information is out there. Uh, Wang and Rubisom uh, said that momentum profits have slowly disappeared since the early 1990s. And then in 2016, Bhattacharya, Lee, and Sonier had a paper in which they showed that momentum profits have become insignificant since the late 1990s. So stock momentum as we know it today was actually presented uh, in a rigorous academic way in 1993 by Jagadish and Titman. So one could also say that because this information is throughout the marketplace now, that that might have had some impact uh, with respect to stock momentum. Okay, I understand. Thank you for that, Gary. But um, do you think that we could have, for example, then an ETF implementing dual momentum? We could. There isn't one yet, but there certainly could be. And uh, in my opinion, there should be. Uh, there are a dozen or so momentum ETFs using individual stocks. Now, uh, someone at uh, Dimensional Fund Advisors uh, recently showed the performance of those funds, and uh, 10 out of the 11 funds have underperformed uh, the, the market since their inception. The only one that's outperformed has the shortest track record of five or six years, and uh, they focused on mega cap uh, growth stocks, which have, have done well during that time. So we'll have to wait and see what happens in the future. Right. I understand. Thank you for that. We'll go into the more details of momentum, but just some more questions. Is value or buy and hold a robust driver from a perspective for uh, achieving abnormal returns? Uh, value investing is what you're asking about? Yes. Well, uh, there's certainly been a lot of research done on it. And most of the research uh, studies were positive initially, but um, not so much anymore. In 2012, Israel and Moskowitz from AQR did a paper in which they said the value premium is weak among the largest stocks. And then a couple of years later, Asnus Frizzini, Israel and Moskowitz, uh, came up with another paper in which they said the market-adjusted return to value within large cap is not uh, different from zero. In other words, uh, large cap funds haven't shown uh, any kind of a momentum premium. Now, small caps, uh, you get into a problem of uh, price impact again, uh, especially when you're dealing with micro caps. It's very difficult uh, to trade those. Uh, someone uh, recently did some research showing that transaction costs of getting in and out micro caps can be uh, 3 to 8% every time you make a trade. So, uh, makes it very challenging. Okay, I understand. Thank you for that. So let's move to our key topic for this interview, momentum. 
And my first question, uh, Gary, is could you please explain in simple words what momentum anomaly is, why it works, and what are the behavioral basis for momentum? Well, momentum is persistence in performance. It means that uh, something that has gone up in the past should continue to go up, uh, or if it's been going down, it should continue to go down. Uh, someone uh, in Texas gave me this analogy. It's like riding a horse in the direction it's going, uh, which makes things easier. Now, momentum was first uh, uncovered in 1937 by Cowles and Jones, who tracked the performance of every NYSE stock uh, from the 20s through the uh, mid-30s. And they found that stocks that had performed well the prior year tended to continue performing well. And uh, academics ignored that uh, until 1990s when Jagadish and Tittman performed a, a rigorous study showing pretty much the same thing, that momentum with stocks uh, <clears throat> works when you're using a three to 12 month uh, look back window or formation period. Uh, now the reason why it works uh, is many fold. Uh, the easiest explanation and probably the most logical one uh, would be behavioral. And that's, has to do with the slow diffusion of information, uh, people and anchoring. These are behavioral aspects. People don't respond right away to information entering the marketplace. There's also the disposition effect, which causes people to take profits too soon and hold on to losers too long. So all of this creates a headwind for prices going to their fair value. But at some point, they have to catch up. And after they catch up, there are other behavioral factors that kick in, such as representativeness. When people see something happening, they assume it's going to continue. They, they tend to be myopic. So trends develop and people develop confidence and overconfidence, and those trends persist. Uh, and markets tend to uh, perhaps overextend. So uh, the overreaction is probably uh, an even stronger aspect of momentum than the underreaction initially. What you need to understand is that although there are two types of momentum, relative and absolute, uh, and people associate absolute momentum with, with trend, momentum is actually trend in all its aspects. With relative momentum, you're measuring a trend or relative strength of one item to another or to a group of others. And in absolute momentum, you're looking at trend or strength with respect to yourself over time. It's sometimes called time series momentum. But they're all dealing with uh, serial correlation or trend. Right, I understand. Thank you for that, Gary. Uh, by the way, even Professor Eugene Fama, creator of the efficient market hypothesis, accepts momentum as the premier anomaly for for achieving high risk adjusted returns. So, so for sure there is something in it. But still, I mean, for years, for many decades in the twentieth century, momentum anomaly was was let's say ignored by by universities. My question, Gary, is because you mentioned already about two types of momentum, the relative, which is also, I found, n n having name cross-sectional and absolute uh, momentum, which is also called, I found, uh, time series momentum. But I wanted to ask you why uh, your uh, absolute momentum approach is, for example, not based on also widely known and used moving averages, for example, 200 days moving average or 10 month moving average? Well, it's similar. They're, they're both uh, do the same thing. They're, they're both uh, trend following. Uh, <clears throat> the 200 day moving average you have a problem with because you get a lot of whipsaws. Uh, you you could go back and forth over that 200 day moving average quite frequently. So uh, sometimes people will use a 10 month moving average instead. Uh, Zaka Mullen has done some research where he's compared different types of moving averages uh, to absolute momentum. And he found only two were significantly, statistically significant. One was momentum, and the other was a reverse exponential moving average. Uh, 
and that the strongest of them was momentum. By the way, because I want to be precise, as maybe someone is not so advanced, because I found absolute momentum at the beginning a bit misleading because we look at an asset's excess return, but we also uh, return less the return of on treasury bills. So basically, could we say that absolute momentum is roughly the same as relative momentum applied to an asset paired up with treasury bills? Because if we are comparing, you know what I mean? Yes, the reason behind that is uh, kind of rooted in the academic world in which they say, well, during the whatever your formation period is, if you could have gotten a higher return just without bearing any risk, why would you not just stay there until you can show a higher return from your risky asset? So that's the reason behind it. It's... Uh, it works both ways, whether you include the risk-free asset or not. Uh, it's just a, a little more appealing from an yeah. academic point of view to compare whatever asset you're looking at to a risk-free uh, return. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, how about adding stop losses to momentum? You could do that. It, it doesn't really add much. I've looked at that. Uh, stop losses used to be uh, looked down upon in the academic world, but there has been some research showing that uh, it can be useful. Uh, it used to be that the research would show, yes, it could limit your downside, but it would limit your upside too. And now if it's applied um, in a more uh, sophisticated way, you might say, uh, it it can... Uh, offer better risk-adjusted returns. But it's redundant when you're using absolute momentum, has, has been my experience. It doesn't really add any more than what absolute momentum provides. Okay, I understand. Thank you for that, Gary. On which time frames momentum works best? I mean, is it uh, monthly or what is the time frame which m momentum works best? It depends on the asset uh, principally, but when you get into short time frames, of a month or under, you're dealing with the opposite of momentum, which is mean reversion. So actually the opposite occurs. Uh, so you might want to uh, uh, trade on an anti-momentum basis on a, a very short term. Uh, so the, the research on stocks have shown that momentum works uh, over a three to 12 month uh, formation period. Uh, six to 12 months is... Uh, particularly strong. In fact, uh, Tobias Moskowitz, one of the uh, chief momentum researchers, has said, momentum is a phenomenon that exists at six to 12 month horizons. Beyond 12 months, momentum wanes. Now, there are some people out there who uh, have tried to extend momentum with stocks uh, beyond 12 months or under three months. And uh, in fact, there have been a couple of uh, research uh, efforts recently in which they've done that to try to uh, make some, some points they wanted to make. But you're really looking outside the realm in which uh, momentum uh, has been shown to work with, with respect to stocks. Okay, I understand. Thank you. How about including value, for example, price-to-book ratio into the momentum? Do you think Actually, I, I'm sure you know that. Would that help to give um, to, to to have a better results? Well, you're dealing apples and oranges because uh, when you're buying value stocks, you're usually buying stocks that are depressed, that have been uh, going down in price or that are languishing. So it's unusual to find value stocks that are exhibiting momentum on a, especially on a 12 month basis which is how momentum is usually used with respect to stocks. It's usually used 6 to 12 months for stocks or the stock market. Right, I understand. Thank you. Before we will go into the details on dual momentum, I wanted to ask you about momentum and mean reversion. As we know, it's an opposite idea to momentum. So we say that if market goes up, it may go higher if we have momentum because of momentum. But on the other side, we say also that if something goes high, it will revert to the mean, it will go down. 
Could you please explain why these two opposite anomalies are valid and in which time frames they work? It may be misleading at some um, at, at first to some people thinking that one am- anomaly cancels the other, but in fact, if they are working just in different time uh, time frames, this is this doesn't doesn't have to be the true. But could you please explain the differences here? Uh, sure. Uh, and what you say is correct. It de- it depends on the time frames. Mean reversion would be uh, one month or less, and uh, this explains how stock specialists used to do so well because they would go against public order flow on a short-term basis. Markets get short-term overextended. Uh, People tend to become over-optimistic or over-pessimistic, and then stocks will mean revert uh, back to a a fairer value. Uh, Mean reversion also works when you reach a three- to five-year horizon. So this might be the realm of value investing, stocks that have been beaten down over the past uh, three to five years, uh, they tend to do uh, a bit better going forward in time. Now, momentum is restricted to, or should be restricted to the three to 12 month horizon if we're talking stocks. Uh, if we're talking other markets, uh, this all changes. So, uh, but if we're dealing with stocks or the stock market, uh, we should be looking three to 12 months or six to 12 months, ideally, in terms of uh, formation period for a momentum type uh, investing. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think it's time to ask you probably the most important question uh, of today's interview. Um, you made a great contribution to the financial world by introducing so-called dual momentum, which combines both types of momentum. Could you please explain the dual momentum concept and how it can be applied? Well, dual momentum is uh, just taking relative strength momentum and uh, absolute momentum and combining them together. Uh, The way we do that is uh, let's take relative momentum first. Now, uh, my very first research paper in 2011, I looked at different ways of applying momentum. And I looked at individual stocks, I looked at industries, uh, styles, uh, geographic diversification. And what I found was that momentum gave the best results when it was applied to geographically diversified stock indices. Now, in 2015, Gexky and Samanoff came up with an academic paper showing the same thing. Uh, They used a broader uh, test. They looked at individual stocks commodities, currencies, uh, bonds, and geographically diversified stock indices. And they found, again, that momentum gave the best results when it was applied to geographically diversified stock indices. So I knew that was the area I wanted to focus on. Now, there's 40-some different uh, countries that you could trade that way, and you would get into a kind of a messy situation if you tried to do these countries individually because many of, well, many of them you couldn't even invest in, but uh, the ones you could, you'd have liquidity uh, problems or issues. You might have uh, volatility issues. So I, I was considering how could these be aggregated? Now, if you go and pick a subset, you might have selection bias if you just pick some of them. So I thought, well, is there some way to do this so it's all inclusive? And fortunately, there's a very convenient way to do it because the U.S. makes up about half of the world's stock market capitalization and the rest of the world is the other half. So I said, okay, let's just apply relative momentum to U.S. stocks versus non-U.S. stocks. And there are uh, large liquid ETFs for both of these. Uh, For U.S. stocks, I'm using the S&P 500 index. And for non-U.S. stocks, you could use uh, one of the ETFs uh, that's focused on the MSCI, All Country World Index, XUS, or something comparable. So I said, okay, let's apply relative momentum to these two. And we'll go with whichever one has has shown better performance over the preceding 12 months. And that will be our relative momentum selection. Okay, and, I understand. And that does that does quite well. Uh, we make uh, over 
more than we would get from just buying and holding uh, a portfolio made up of these two by themselves. So, um, but the problem with relative momentum is you have the same downside that you have with the uh, assets that make it up. So your your drawdowns are are equally as bad. Your volatility is equally as high. So I said, well, let's apply absolute momentum to this, in or, because that's the the real value of absolute momentum is uh, how it can reduce your downside exposure during bear markets. So I said, let's key off of the, say, the S&P 500 index, because uh, research has shown that U.S. stocks tend to lead the rest of the world. So let's say uh, we apply absolute momentum to the S&P 500. And what we'll say is, if the S&P 500 index has gone up relative to T-bills, over the past year, then we'll be in stocks. If the S&P 500 index has been down over the past year, then we'll go to the safety of intermediate term bonds. Because again, momentum is persistence in performance. So if stocks have been going up the past year, the odds are they'll continue to go up. And if they've gone down over the past year, they should continue to go down. So the way I actually apply it is I look at the S&P 500 first and I say, have they, has the S&P 500 gone up or down over the past year? If it's gone down, then I'll go into an ETF for aggregate bonds, which is uh, investment grade, high quality, widely diversified portfolio of intermediate term bonds. And if the S&P 500 index has gone up, and absolute momentum is positive, then I'll apply relative momentum to the S&P 500 index and the all-country world index. And whichever one of the two has done better over the past 12 months, that's the one I'll invest in until that situation changes. And I check that every month. So there's month, right. monthly rebalancing. There's not a lot of trading. There's about 1.4 trades per year. So we don't have to worry about price impact uh, or crowding. Uh, ETFs for these are enormous. Uh, there's no problem in terms of uh, liquidity or uh, market impact. Okay. Thank you for that, Gary. And you call this strategy Global Equity Momentum, GEM. I just wanted to ask you um, some basic statistics behind this strategy What um, in terms of maximum drawdown, uh, standard deviation or um, skewness or left tail risk profit. Mm -hmm. How does it look? Because as you said that when we apply only uh, relative momentum, then basically there's not so much improvement, but the absolute momentum is a big uh, game changer, so to speak. Yes. Uh, well, they both are game changers. Uh, some people might not appreciate that, but uh, they're, they're both quite important. And um, as far as the numbers go, uh, the, going back to 1950 on um, my GEM model, the uh, compound annual growth rate is 15.8%. The uh, standard deviation is 11.5. Uh, uh, the uh, maximum drawdown, 18%. And uh, right. the, uh, you were asking... Uh, what else? The skew, I believe. Uh, yes. Yeah, that was Skewness. minus point yes. minus point one two. In, in contrast, the S and P five hundred skew is minus point four three, and the global asset allocation uh, benchmark is minus point five four. So it does a, a good job of uh, dealing with uh, left tail risk. Right. I understand. Uh, by the way, there are, as far as I understood two ways of applying uh, momentum in a GEM model. I mean, in the first approach, you apply the absolute momentum on S&P 500. But in the second approach, what you uh, talked uh, about before, we apply as the first step, we apply the relative momentum. And um, and then basically uh, uh, you you go further from, from that. But wh why I'm asking this is uh, because 
we can choose whichever uh, approach we would like to use in our trading, right? But yes. uh, as far as I understand, you prefer to use uh, first to to use the uh, the absolute momentum on on S and P five hundred to see if the uh, trend on the stock market is in uptrend. Yes, I do. Uh, there's a paper by Rapash. It's uh, there's a reference to it in my book and on my blog, uh, in which uh, they show that U.S. stocks uh, tend to be uh, a leading indicator of what's happening with respect to a world economy and uh, global stocks. So I prefer to key off of that, <clears throat> but they both give good results. Um, the, applying absolute momentum first gives slightly better results, but that's not the main reason why I do it. I do it because uh, I think it makes more sense. Right. But but we can have a situation in which, for example, the rest of the world is in, in the uptrend, but we would hold bonds in our portfolio because the S&P would be in downtrend. This is possible, I mean, at least in theory. In theory, it's possible. That situation doesn't last very long. It usually resolves itself one way or the other. So like I say, uh, that's why I, I presented both uh, ways in my book. So people can choose okay. whichever they prefer. I understand. Uh, what are the main advantages of dual momentum? I mean, I'm asking in terms of scalability or volatility. We already said a bit about this or the costs. You said that there are not too many um, transactions. And also what is uh, very important, at least from my point of view, but I'm a software engineer. So mm -hmm. to me, it's pretty important. It's a disciplined approach. It's a rule-based approach. How do you see the, the main advantages of dual momentum? Well, uh, that's that's a good point. Uh, any rules based approach is uh, is worthwhile uh, looking at because it takes a lot of the anxiety and guesswork out of uh, making an investment decision. So then, what you need is a discipline to stick with it, and that can sometimes be challenging. Every time you deviate from the market portfolio, there's a potential to have uh, your portfolio underperform. And that happens with uh, dual momentum as well as anything else. We will have times when we underperform our benchmark. We'll have times when there are whipsaws and uh, people tend to sometimes get emotionally caught up in those things and lose sight of the big picture. Uh, and right. there, there have been some blog posts recently trying to take advantage of that, exploit that. Uh, behavioral weakness among people uh, by presenting them with uh, alternative scenarios. But it's important. So it's important to understand, have a good understanding of what you're doing and why you're doing it, and then to have confidence in it for right, I understand. over the long run. Keep, keep in mind that Jim, as presented in my book, the Sharpe ratio is 0.96. You know, and you compare that to uh, global asset allocation of 0.57 you know it's, there's there's reasons yeah. why you you want to uh, give it some uh, serious consideration and try to understand it as best you can right i understand but do you think that uh the short term volatility uh which of course is is in long term approach as dual momentum do you think that this is the biggest issue for being disciplined for uh, while following such strategy, because people are too much focused on the very short period of time. They don't see the longer term. That's part of it. Uh, another part of it is sometimes people are just a bit fickle and they're always looking for something new, something different. And uh, they tend to forget uh, the salient features of what they're with. So that's why uh, I encourage people to Reread my book, especially Chapter 8, to uh, read my blog posts, to uh, read the research that's out there so that they uh, continue to have understanding and appreciation for what's going on. You look at uh, professions and there's continuing education in a lot of them. I think it's necessary that people uh, remind themselves of why they were interested in something in the first place. and so that they don't lose sight of uh, the principles and uh, the desirable features. Right. The gem is very simple. 
and very effective. But this is also, I know this uh, from being a software engineer also, people sometimes believe more in something complex because they think if there are more moving parts, it's, you know, it's more reliable, but it's the opposite, actually, that if something works and it's simple, then it's more reliable. But we as people, we have a, you know, different nature. That's a, that's a very good point. And you should make, should realize the importance of what you just said. Everyone should realize that because, uh, not only is complicated, uh, not something you should be attracted to, but you should, uh, be very cautious when something is complicated uh, because you, whenever you have more moving parts, you have more danger of overfitting, of over-specification, of, uh, and we see that all the time uh, in research. Uh, there have been studies done in the academic side uh, with respect to factors, for example, where uh, many of them don't do as well out of sample, uh, real time. Uh, as opposed to when they were first developed. And that has a lot to do with the fact that these models uh, may have been overspecified or uh, put together in such a way that uh, they basically were designed to conform to the data. Right. Thank you for that, Gary. Um, I found on your blog a note about dollar cost averaging, DCA, used with dual momentum. And my question is, have you maybe analyzed the, another case where we would be adding new capital to our portfolio, but not per DCA uh, strategy, but when it's in a draw, drawdown? So basically a kind of equity line trading. So let's say that on a regular basis, we are going to add extra capital to our portfolio, but instead of doing that every month or, or so, we will do it when we are in drawdown, let's say, on a certain level. That's, uh, that's a good idea. Most people have a problem with that psychologically. They, they tend to want to do the opposite. And in fact, going back all my years from running hedge funds to uh, managing accounts to uh, putting together models, uh, the, the one thing I can say with certainty, and I can't say any pretty much anything else with certainty. But the one thing I can say with pretty much certainty is that uh, when people withdraw, when they pull money away from a program, it almost invariably does well after that. So that's my, that's my top indicator uh, for uh, good performance going forward is when, uh, when blood is running in the streets, you might say. Uh, that's when they say the best time to invest is. And uh, that's true. And when you think about it, it makes sense because uh, those who have sold, uh, have, who are going to sell, you know, that's when they do it. And uh, yeah. then the only people left around are buyers who have some modicum of intelligence who uh, recognize that uh, opportunities lie ahead. Right. I had on my podcast Tom Basso. He's also a trend follower and, and he, he supports that idea of adding more money to your portfolio if you are in drawdown. But as you said, people tend to do the opposite. And, um, and that's why maybe the markets are inefficient, by the way. I have another question to you, uh, Gary, about the fact that the gem or the dual momentum is publicly known. Do you think that because dual momentum uh, is investing in a very broad market like S&P 500 or rest of the world, it is much less prone to that it will stop working in the future because so many people will start using it? Because if we would use it on the, uh, if we would apply it to individual stocks, of course, we will have quickly problems, especially if someone has a bigger capital. But here we are investing in the broadest market. So do you think that still there is a risk that it may stop working or it will not be so efficient in the future? Well, there's that risk with every investment, uh, but I think it's uh, not, not so high with uh, dual momentum the way I use it. For one reason is, as you say, these, <clears throat> these markets are enormous. You can go into the S&P 500 index with, billions at a time have no, you know, no impact. And uh, the same with uh, 
the rest of the world are aggregate bonds. But the other reason is behavioral. Uh, dual momentum is is not as popular as one might think. There, are, as you pointed out, there are no uh, dual momentum ETFs now, uh, and uh, right. I have some proprietary models which I license to investment advisors, and the amount of capital being managed there. While uh, while it's nice, you know, it's it's not very large compared to other investment programs out there. I just I think that people have trouble getting their heads around this. Uh, one reason might being that it it it's dual. It involves a couple of different concepts that people have to understand and appreciate, and the other just has to do with uh, it being something different than what people are used to. Right, I understand. Thank you for that, Gary. By the way, you mentioned about uh, proprietary strategies. So, who's the target for these strategies? Is it is it developed for mostly institutions, or it could be also used by a retail trader? Because the GEM model is very simple, and uh, I see the big value in it because it's very simple. You can spend just a few minutes a month, basically, on it, and that's it. And 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 you don't have to uh, really dedicate more time on it. Yes, the. Gem was developed that way. I wanted something that I could put in a book that I could uh, give to the public so they could take advantage of this uh, simply, easily, uh, without expending too much time or energy. And that was uh, relatively tax efficient because there's only 1.4 trades per year. Uh, most of our gains, 70% of the gains, in fact, tend to be long-term capital gains. And um, most of the losses tend to be short term, so it, it's tax efficient. Now, in the proprietary models, uh, those are targeted towards uh, wealthy individuals or uh, institutional investors uh, sometimes. And uh, there's more that goes into them. We try to be more adaptive to market conditions. We use different look back periods in an intelligent way, not just randomly. Uh, We applied uh, dual momentum to the fixed income market as well as uh, to the stock markets. And uh, there's, there's some nuances that go into those models. Okay, I understand. But do you prefer to license them rather than run, for example, your own hedge fund? I've had hedge funds before in the past. I'm 69 years old. I don't really want to get into all the administrative side of things anymore. And I prefer doing research and writing and uh, having time for other things. So I think it's a, good, it's a good partnership. I can license to a few investment advisors who understand and appreciate what I do. And they can handle administration and marketing, and I could spend my time uh, doing what I think I'm best at. I would like to talk a bit about the backtesting uh, momentum or dual momentum. How should we approach the model backtesting to avoid problems with the curve fitting, data snooping, or um, selection bias? Because as as there is a saying that if if you torture your data long enough, it will confess to anything. But how you approach to backtesting so that you are sure that it's done correctly? That's an excellent question. I don't think it gets asked enough. The The first thing is to make sure there's a logical basis for it, that theory supports it. And that's the nice thing about momentum, is that there are explanations for why it works. Uh, and academic papers, you usually see that. They don't just deal with empirical uh, data. They they want to know why something works. So that's that's the main thing. Uh, if you're just going out there blindly mining data, you're going to come up with results that look attractive, no doubt about it, but many times those will be spurious results. The other thing is to make sure there's a validation out of sample. So that's the nice thing about uh, both types of momentum. Uh, academics keep going further and further back in time. It started out you know, using just a 10-year period in the 1930s when uh, Cowles and Jones did their work. And then uh, with Jagadish and Tishman, they had a data set from the 60s 
through the 80s. And then it's gradually been taken further and further back. Uh, Getsky and Samanov have tested both types of momentum back to the year 1801. And they found that it's consistent and robust and works across different markets. So that's another thing you look at is how consistent is it? Does it work in other markets? Are the parameters stable? Uh, there's a whole lot of things that you should consider. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Grazerman and took the basically a 12-month trend type momentum all the way back as far as he could, almost to the time of Genesis. So uh, those are the kinds of things you look at. You don't just go and play around with uh, the data, especially a limited amount of data. Okay, I understand. But are you dividing your data into in-sample set and out-of-sample for verification? Or you know that you have some kind of verification because, like, for example, there were some researches done in the uh, before the Second World War and it worked till nowadays, then you know that it, this is basically out of sample. So you're not doing any magic on the data that you split uh, for in sample, out of sample. That can be deceiving. People, you know, sometimes say, well, I held out data. But what happens if that hold out data doesn't work? You know, what do you do? Uh, some people will just tweak their model and try it again. Right. Uh, do they really go on to something else entirely? Uh, there's no way of knowing. So when I first developed uh, the GEM model, the dual momentum, I was using data from 1975 through, uh, I believe, 2012. And since then, I've, I've been able to get data going further back in time. I, I started now in 1950. So, well, the first incremental edition of data I got took me to 1970, uh, and so I had that bear market, and it held up really well uh, during that time. And then I was able to get more data, which I took back to 1950. And it, it's it's done fine, both in sample and out of sample. But more importantly, we have all these other out of sample tests that have been going on ever since uh, the the seminal momentum paper was came out in uh, 1993. Okay, I understand. Yes, uh, I think also that. Uh still using in-sample, out-of-sample, we still uh, can be in the pitfall of curve fitting. Therefore, for example, a kind of randomized out-of-sample test may be more uh, useful. Do you, do you agree with such a uh, statement? It depends. It's, it's better to just have the actual data and to have actual out-of-sample data. When you try to randomize things, you're, you're not always going to get them uh, to conform to the way that the markets are. The markets tend, tend to be uh, stochastic in nature. Uh, there's non-constant variance. There's, you know, you have regime shifts over time that are quite different. Uh, so it's, it's always better to have real data than to try to do some type of resampling. I understand. Um, Gary, I wanted to ask you about the 12-month look-back period. Uh, I know that there is a big history behind it so it's not like out of the blue 12 months it has the good reason to be 12 months but i wanted to ask you a question does it still make any sense to try at least periodically re-optimize this parameter so that strategy could let's say adapt to market changes or do you think it's it's not a good way to go well because there's a lot of data to validate this, it, you would need a lot of data to unvalidate it, let's say, too. So right. I don't think that that is uh, something that one should be focusing on. Now, there's nothing holy about a 12-month look back. Uh, there, like I mentioned, uh, there are ways to use other look backs, but not just randomly pick different uh, monthly periods. Uh, I have a more, uh, I think, a more intelligent way to select uh, look-back periods. That's that is part of my proprietary models, uh, so I can't discuss them in detail. But 12-month look-back is is still uh, a very useful one, and uh, it's held it's held up well uh, back to the 1200s. So I don't think people can really 
say that it's just uh, a lucky uh, guess that you're going with 12 months. Yeah, thank you, Gary. I found, for example, that uh, I had Perry Kaufman on my on my show some months ago, and uh, he was mentioning about the percentage spaced test values. So, for example, in Gem, we could have, uh, let's say, a three, six, 12 months uh, look back period. Do you think that such approach indeed, in terms of Gem, could be applicable? Uh, yes, I'm familiar with, uh, I know Perry, I'm familiar with his work. Now, he made a good point in that if you equally space your look back period, uh, you're going to favor uh, a certain area because, you know, the, because of the way that the time thing works. So uh, you sh- there's some drawbacks to doing that. And that's one of the reasons why I don't do it. Um, I think there are more intelligent ways to select your look back periods. Right. I understand. By the way, what tools, software or programming languages, um, Gary, do you use when you create and test your models? I use Excel to a great extent. It's uh, it's done everything right. I need to do. Occasionally, I'll use R or Python for uh, some specific purpose. But you can do all of this in Excel. Right, of course. And uh, as for the data, because this is the business where we are re- really data hungry, so to speak. So do you have any special special source of data so that you could go back to 1950? Is it publicly available? Uh, if you've got plenty of money to spend, it is. That's the problem with the data. Uh, okay. It used to be uh, if you asked S&P nicely, they would give you their data. They don't do that anymore. Uh, the MSCI data is available to the public. If you have the right link, you can get it back to the 1970s. Uh, bond data uh, is problematic. So uh, fortunately, some of the advisors I work with uh, have access to this data and they make it available to me going back uh, pretty much as far as I need. Okay, I understand. We talked already about that people tend to focus too much on the uh, short-term volatility, but at the end of 2018, um, let's say it was tough uh, for gem strategy, which is absolutely normal. But but then we saw some comments on the internet, people commenting, is it working or not? And I wanted to use this as a trigger to some discussion about how difficult, in fact, is to follow a strategy, even if it has a very good track record, but which enters a worse period having bad performance. Why do you think people have a problem to, to, to follow uh, the rule-based strategy, even if they are so well, let's say, um, educated in that? Because I, I will talk about, for example, um, a guy, Corey Hofston from Newfound Research, who's a very well uh, educated guy in, in that area. Or also I found uh, Michael Harris on the Price Action Lab who said that GEM is best based on the hindsight and some optimization and also wishful thinking. So, I mean, I appreciate your research effort, Gary, and I don't know of anyone doing his homework so well as you did, but could you please comment these critical comments against GEM? Well, uh, <coughs> Corey's comment was uh, based on uh, a small amount of research he did he, over a 10-year period he looked at using uh, every look back from six to 12 months. So there's seven of them. And he said uh, that they're statistically equivalent. Uh, but you can't really do that using just 10 years of data and get anything meaningful, especially when these look backs are, are correlated to one another. Uh, so, But his point on saying that was that uh, you end up with specification risk by going with just one look back. Uh, however, as I show in the log, blog post I, I came up with as a response, uh, there isn't that much difference in terms of the results, whether you go with uh, 12 months, which has been shown to work effectively, uh, or, uh, or some combination. Now, there are other ways of dealing with specification risk, too, than just uh, changing your look-back period. Uh, you may not want to change your look back period. Let's say if you're someone who just bought my book and want a simple way to implement it without having to use 
seven different look back periods or and uh, Corey also says you should use different time periods as well so if you were doing it every week instead of every month with seven look backs you have 28 different models well i don't know how too many people who are going to want to run 28 different models and if you did uh your tax benefits would most likely not be there anymore so another way to deal with specification risk is just just to put other assets into your portfolio and uh not only does that get rid of specification risk, but it gets rid of model risk as well, because uh, you're diversified in the sense of uh, what you're doing uh, and not just in how you're doing it. Uh, as far as Michael Harris's uh, blog post, I, I just don't understand what he's what he's getting at there. I'm not. I don't think he does either. He was saying that. Uh, Jim has a, a, a the dual momentum approach I'm taking uh, is not doing well now because of the market impact from uh, large funds doing it. Well, there are no ETFs, there are no funds that I know of who are using dual momentum. Uh, furthermore, Harris took a, 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 a range of lookbacks from one to 24 months over a 10 year window, and he said, okay. The, the far ends, like uh, below three months and over 12 months, uh, they had large drawdowns. Well, that's garbage in, garbage out. There's no way anyone who has studied momentum research would use, you know, look backs that short and especially look backs that long and draw, to try to draw any kind of meaningful conclusions. And looking at anything over just a 10-year window is, is not good research either. Uh, and then he right. made a statement that uh, GM outperforms on a risk-adjusted basis only in the limited time period presented. Uh, and he all he showed was a, a 10-year period. So he, gave, he didn't show anything to support what he was saying, and it's not true what he said anyway. Thank you for that, uh, Gary, for that explanation. By the way, I found funny on your blog, uh, you showed your coffee mug uh, in your office where you have a label saying um, even dead cards bounce which reminds you about short term mean reversion because I see that people are very interested about you know we have some pundits so to speak saying that the strategy doesn't uh, doesn't work because it's in the period of worse performance which is natural but if it's performing very well we cannot find them so this is just my small comment on that. Well, there's no, there's no worse performance here uh, at all. Yeah, uh, you know, it's normal. Yeah, it's uh, we we had a uh, a whipsaw at the end of last year, and we missed out on uh, a month of profit in the S and P. And if you look on the table, where you see the history from the fifties till nowadays, it it's absolutely normal to what we saw in the past. There's nothing exceptional. So uh, I'm not involved in that emotionally. I don't put any money there, but I see I, I cannot find any issue there. Okay. By the way, if we are talking about the risk, would you suggest anyone interested in using any strategy to do risk tolerance assessment, which can show us if our financial objectives are too conservative or maybe they are too aggressive? That's always a good idea. You want to find an investment that uh, suits you uh, financially and emotionally. Uh, the best investment is the one that you're going to stick with. So if uh, a certain investment is uh, too volatile, you can uh, re reduce the volatility by adding uh, more stable assets to it. <clears throat> In terms of my proprietary models, I have three of them. I have uh, an enhanced version of the global equities momentum, as we've been talking about. I have a global uh, balanced momentum, an enhanced version of that, that has a 30% fixed allocation to bonds that are managed according to dual momentum. And I have a global conservative momentum, which has an even higher proportion of fixed income. Okay. Thank you for that, Gary. Do you think that um, an average investor or trader may compete with professionals like hedge funds, or is it worth to do so in your opinion? 
Yes, uh, hedge funds uh, are, are nothing uh, remarkable, especially uh, now. It used to be that uh, some of the best traders uh, started hedge funds because they wanted to participate in profits. Uh, but over the last uh, 20 years, anyone and his brother can start a hedge fund, and many of them have. And uh, just because something is a hedge fund doesn't mean that it's uh, better than anything else. Um, and uh, the data shows that to be true. And uh, not that many of them hedge anymore either. So uh, I think something like dual momentum uh, people can do, whereas an institutional investor, hedge fund or not, might be more reluctant to because of uh, career risk. Anytime you deviate from what other people are doing, you uh, run the risk of being fired if you underperform. Uh, you can be wrong as long as everybody else is wrong. But if you're wrong when everybody else is right, uh, there's a very good chance you're going to lose your job. So individual investors uh, don't have to worry about that. What they have to worry about is uh, psychologically uh, firing themselves by abandoning a program if it has a period of underperformance. I understand. By the way, I, I read in your book that you were in the army, you were a Vietnam vet. And do you think that your military background drives certain character traits that are useful in investing world? Do you think that this kind of experience is helpful to be more disciplined? I think so. I think uh, being disciplined is is essential when you're following a rule-based strategy. Uh, being able to uh, follow orders which is uh, the orders of the model, uh, not abandoning your post. That's uh, the first thing we learned in the military uh, until properly relieved. So uh, unless something better comes along, this is what I'm going with. Right, I understand. We are slowly reaching to the end of this interview, but I have a few uh, more questions. And uh, I wanted to ask you about, because we were talking about the long-term trading approach, how about some short-term trading strategies, uh, short-term approach? Do you prefer long-term? Is there a specific reason why you just focus on long-term? Well, it's, uh, it's easier uh, long-term. The markets, uh, what I want to do is be in tune with the markets. And momentum works, you know, using a six to 12-month look back uh, primarily. And that's a slower moving approach. Uh, you don't get involved in, in so much uh, chop in terms of the market. Occasionally, you'll get a whipsaw. You'll get periods of underperformance. But uh, the advantage of what I do is that we sidestep uh, bear markets for the most part. And uh, because of relative momentum, we're able to pick up uh, extra return by switching between U.S. and non-U.S. stocks. Now, that's not to say that <clears throat> they're – People can't make money with shorter-term trading. In fact, I've, I've been working on some uh, shorter-term uh, models uh, across different markets now. And uh, But you have to be more involved. You can't just look at those uh, once a month or twice a month like we do right. with proprietary models. Uh, I look at, only have to dial those up twice a month. But uh, for shorter-term models, I have to look at what's going on uh, every day. So uh, people who want to make that kind of commitment, uh, there's certainly profits to be had there too. Right. But of course, especially from the point of view of a retail trader, long-term approach is easier in terms of execution as well. As you said, we can just do it once a month, for example, in comparison to do it daily. Well, st studies have shown that one of the disadvantages that retail uh, traders have is that they tend to overtrade and that works against them. Right, right. Um, so when I was reading your materials on the blog and your book, I was really impressed by the amount of the information I could find there. And just out of curiosity, how many, I mean, is it, was it just you writing all this, creating all this, or you have some people helping you as well? Because it's it's just incredible how many information you put there uh it's just amazing oh th thank you i read a lot i uh i think uh, continuing education is really useful nobody has all the all the answers to everything i'm always trying to learn and and grow 
uh, as a investor, a, a model builder, and an individual. So uh, it's important to try to keep an open mind and, and be humble. Uh, markets will uh, will teach you humility, if nothing else. Right, right. I understand. Thank you for that. Uh, Gary, before we, we finish today, is there anything you would like to add? Any extra comments or anything you would like to add? I haven't asked you, maybe. Well, uh, I think it's important for people to um, follow the, this precepts. And I, I've heard them used in other areas, not just in investing. But what you want to do is uh, investigate carefully, you know, look at all the information, uh, choose wisely, and follow faithfully. Right. Very interesting. Okay, thank you for that. If someone would like to contact you, what's the best way to do it, Gary? You can do it through my website or blog. Uh, there's links there for sending me emails. My website is uh, optimalmomentum.net and my blog is uh, dualmomentum.com. Okay, I will put all the details on my, on my website uh, under this episode so everyone will can find it there. Gary, I'm very grateful for your time and effort. I appreciate it very much. My apologies for waking you up uh, early in the morning today. Um, as it was pretty early in California when we started the, this podcast, I'm absolutely sure that by covering so much ground in this interview, many listeners will be inspired to do further research and further reading as it's really worthwhile to do it. And um, I'm very, very uh, grateful for, for your time you spent with us today here my pleasure and uh thank you for your insightful questions i think this is one of the best interviews i've ever had huh, thank you for that thank you have a good day thank you you too bye-bye